After that outstanding talk and educative talk from Professor Marcus, I, on behalf of the team ILBS, extend a very hearty welcome to Professor Don Rocky, who is Professor of Medicine at Medical University of Southern Carolina. I can only tell, uh, I have known him for almost three decades, and Don had been a leader, and uh, it's a privilege for ILBS to have you with us, Don, and he'll be talking to us on management of drug-induced liver injury. He is a portal hypertension man. Please come, Don. Uh, but also in his new avatar, and now he has started saying namaste. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, it's a real. Um, a pleasure and a delight uh, to visit you. I, I have to tell you how much I enjoyed the uh, the sessions yesterday. Congratulations on a, a wonderful uh, event uh, drills. Um, and I'm very impressed by the center here, and I look forward to seeing some of the labs and some of the other uh, parts of the center. Um, so it's our national holiday today, although I have the wrong year here. Uh, <laughs> this is Charleston, where I'm from. We're standing on the medical center, looking across. You want me to get closer? This is the this is the Ravenel Bridge. This is the longest cable-spanning bridge in the in the North American continent, and our house is uh, this house right here. So, um, with that, let me um, let me tell you what I'm going to try to cover today. Our learning objectives. I'm I'm going to try to keep this simple. I'm going to try to keep this around 20 minutes. We're going to talk about um, idiosyncratic DILI. I'm not going to get into pathogenesis that much. The pathogenesis is actually largely unknown and quite complicated. I'm going to emphasize um, a, some diagnostic criteria and emphasize the point that uh, drug-induced liver injury can mimic essentially any liver disease. And I have to tell you, I was delighted to hear yesterday or to see how often DILI was raised in the differential diagnosis. And I'm going to focus on causality assessment and why it's challenging, largely because it's a diagnosis of exclusion and you have to be on your toes to, to make this diagnosis. I'm going to talk a little bit about background, causality assessment. I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of time on causality instruments and talk a little bit about a new causality instrument that we've developed and then <clears throat> I'll summarize. So the patient um, that we saw, a 48-year-old woman with a history of recurrent UTIs, presented with a two-week history of nausea and malaise. Past medical history was notable for taking nitrofurantoin for prophylaxis over the last three years, no change in dosage. She drinks alcohol socially, but the husband says she actually may drink a bit more than she let on. Um, she took other medications, including uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen. On physical exam, she was thin, had faint scleral icterus. The liver was 12 centimeters in span, non-tender. There was no ascites. Uh, the laboratory data are shown here. You can see the AST, the ALT. Uh, total bilirubin was 5.2 alkfos, 159. The INR was 1.2. Hepatitis C antibodies were negative. The hep B surface antigen was negative. It, positive ANA, AMA, SMA were negative, and IgG was uh, 1,400. Here are her laboratories uh, in, um, in the context of the timing here. So um, at baseline, her liver tests were normal. Um, and then when she presented, you can see the liver test here. So there was a, a quite prominent increase in uh, ALT, which declined. But notice that this decline was relatively slow. Um, and we'll come back and talk about that in a little bit. And then eventually, she did normalize. Uh, her liver tests. So the diagnosis of DILI is challenging because it is entirely a diagnosis of exclusion. There are no diagnostic tests to verify this diagnosis, and therefore um, the diagnosis has to be made with simply the available, the clinical information that you have available to you. Although DILI is rare, it accounts for some 10 percent of all causes of hepatitis. So it, in my practice, it's very common, and I'm certain that it is relatively common in your practice as well. It is actually a common cause of acute liver failure, 
And uh, as you, I'm sure, know that DILI associated with acute liver failure is probably the poor, poorest prognosis of all the causes of, uh, of ALF. And also, interestingly, drug-induced liver injury is currently now the most frequently cited reason for withdrawal of medications from the marketplace. And so for the FDA in the United States, I actually don't know, I'm not entirely sure what your regulatory environment is like here, but in the U.S., this is a huge problem and is by far and away the most common reason for drugs to be withdrawn from the market or not even make it to the market. Estimates of DILI are somewhere around 10 to 20 per 100,000 patient years, uh, one every um, 10,000 to a million prescriptions. Uh, it's a clinical diagnosis. We're going to talk about latency and severity. Concomitant medications are a real problem, especially when you're trying to pinpoint a culprit lesion. Exclusion of competing causes is oftentimes difficult and requires some expertise. D-challenge requires time, so when you're seeing the patient for the first time, you don't have that data in hand. There is no classic liver histology, and we actually uh, just published a paper on uh, drug-induced uh, liver injury and histology, and the histology is generally not uh, terribly helpful. And again, there is no uh, confirmatory uh, test. So this is kind of the way that I envision um, clinical scenarios in drug-induced liver injury. The most common scenario is that patients have asymptomatic disease, and we don't even, I don't even see these patients, and I suspect you don't either. Uh, patients can develop symptomatic disease, often with nausea, vomiting, um, and usually markedly abnormal liver tests. Then we have severe drug-induced liver injury, and of course the, the most rare and most problematic um, type of DILI is acute liver failure. So there are uh, different types of um, DILI, or at least um, in my thought process, I think of uh, DILI in this uh, in this term. Um, I've I've b bundled these into direct hepatotoxins, indirect hepatotoxins, and idiosyncratic drugs. So. In my practice, by far and away, the most common type of drug-induced liver injury is idiosyncratic. And this is not dose-related. It is rare. It is, um, the timing can be anything. Um, although I'm going to emphasize uh, in the second part of the talk that timing actually probably is a very important component of the causality assessment. But again, as I mentioned, the pathogenesis of idiosyncratic DILI is largely unknown. My, my, suspicion, my strong suspicion is, is that it is probably immunologic, and there are genetic data emerging that suggests that there are certain immune features that may predispose patients to, um, to DILI. Liver test patterns can be pretty much anything. The most common cause right now at least in the United States, of drug-induced liver injury are antibiotics. And by far and away, the number one most common cause of DILI in the U.S. is augmentin. Um, there are also direct hepatotoxins. You're all familiar with acetaminophen. Indirect hepatotoxins, um, such as the anti-cancer drugs that you've just been hearing about, are examples of those, and their mechanism is likely um, immunologic. So the differential diagnosis, um, not dose-related, important concern, important consideration. Timing is critical. D-challenge is important. Signatures, I think if you don't remember anything else today, I'd like you to take home that most drugs have a typical signature. And uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, is there prior information about the drug? So some drugs cause drug-induced liver injury, others do not. So INH is a, is a uh, classic um, offender, but propranolol never causes drug-induced liver injury. So for some reason, there are those that do and those that don't. And then uh, when you're uh, analyzing a case, um, you must have good data and other liver diseases must be, uh, must be excluded. Uh, we've actually studied the quality of the data that go into making the diagnosis, and it turns out that the quality of your data are important. So what kind of causality uh, assessment tools do we have available? Uh, there are generic instruments like the WHO or Bayesian tools. 
There are liver specific tools, expert opinion, I'm going to talk about that. The, uh, the RUCAM is important. Do you guys, does, do you use RUCAM here? Yes, no, yes, everybody knows about RUCAM. Um, there are some others, the CDS scale, uh, the adverse drug probability scale, uh, or Naranjo scale, um, uh, a Japanese scale called the DDWJ scale, and then there are some others. And I'm going to talk about one of the new ones. So this is the RUCAM. The RUCAM has seven domains. Um, it looks better on your screen than it does on my screen. Um, the, those domains include the, the latency, the course that includes D-challenge. The RUCAM includes risk factors, uh, including um, age and ethanol, even though there are no data to support the importance of age or ethanol in the pathogenesis of DILI. And so uh, they're, they're the new uh, efforts at revising the RUCAM are actually excluding alcohol and uh, age. Uh, the other domains include the concomitant drugs, so is the patient um, receiving other drugs? And, um, and then, of course, in my view, the most important domain is the search for non-drug causes. So does the patient have a viral infection? Is there shock liver? Um, and so on. And then, of course, uh, is there previous information on hepatotoxicity of the drugs? As I mentioned, there are some drugs that are classic hepatotoxins and there are others that are not. And then rechallenge is important. We actually don't do rechallenge very often, but if you do, uh, it can be important. And then, of course, for each one of these domains, points are assigned, and then a total point score is, uh, is uh, derived. Just uh, to remind you about the R value, so the R value comes into play when we assess the, uh, the latency and the D-challenge components, the timing, challenge, uh, the timing elements of the RUCAM. And you can see here that's ALT divided by a uh, alkaline phosphatase. Uh, and we generally divide uh, drug-induced liver injury into three specific categories, primary hepatocellular, cholestatic, or mixed uh, reactions. And again, most drugs have a phenotype of one or more of these R values. Uh, so in our patient, the R value is 14, so that's a primary hepatocellular uh, reaction. Uh, th these are the, the point score summary of, uh, of the RUCAM. So you can see here the seven domains, and you get um, points here. So the, the total score can be anywhere from negative to, um, what is the grand total there, 13. And then you are assigned a likelihood of drug-induced liver injury. Uh, uh, minus 9 to, nine to 14, of uh, highly probable, probable, possible, unlikely, or excluded. Uh, and this has been in use now for some 30 years. So there are problems with RUCAM, though. It is complicated. Um, I just spent five minutes going through RUCAM. It takes much longer than that to actually um, understand and even longer to apply that to a patient. Uh, there, the criteria for competing causes and other drugs are not clear. Uh, there are, again, as I mentioned, there are no data to support the use of alcohol or age. And it is a real problem in patients who have a long, a delayed onset, a delayed latency, or a long D challenge. And in fact, the RUCAM is derived from expert opinion rather than prospectively collected data. So it was, it was developed in a smoke-filled room. In, um, in, in Europe some 35 years ago, and uh, it really is um, simply um, an amalgamation of expert opinion. Um, it also um, uh, overweights rechallenge, uh, which, as I mentioned, almost never happens. So in our patient, the, uh, the RUCAM score was one, which is unlikely, so this is the uh, so the patient got minus points for a course because of a very long D challenge. And so that was not taken into account. When in fact, the, um, this patient um, had um, a classic, or what appeared to be a classic nitrofurantoin-induced, drug-induced liver injury. So a couple of pearls here, uh, acute or chronic hepatitis, um, you must obtain RNA. 
Um, we have uh, published a manuscript on the uh, unlikely cases and the hepatitis C cases, and these are missed because an, an antibody is obtained and not an RNA. So when I see a patient, I don't even ask about the antibody. I want when somebody has abnormal liver tests, I ask for the RNA. Uh, NASH is a problem. Granulomatous liver diseases uh, can sometimes mimic uh, DILI. SOS, uh, especially now with the chemotherapeutic regimens, often comes up. Uh, malignancy, especially with infiltrated liver diseases in patients with ALKFOS. ALKFOS is elevated out of proportion to the other liver tests, and I think there was a patient yesterday like this. And then, of course, in transplant patients, uh, rejection is a problem. Um, so I mentioned the phenotypes. So these are data from the drug-induced drug liver injury network. And you can see here I've grouped drugs, or at least classic drugs, into hepatocellular reactions, mixed reactions, or cholestatic reactions. So INH, green tea, uh, clozapine, minocycline, anti-TNF, the PDL1s actually cause a primary hepatocellular pattern. Some of these, INH, green tea, and clomethazapine, only cause hepatocellular. So if you have a patient with uh, that you think has drug-induced liver injury from one of these three things and they have a mixed or a cholestatic R value, I would recommend caution and urge you to reconsider the diagnosis. Um, some of these are all over the map. Uh, so the statins can do just about anything. The, the quinolones, the cephalosporins, um, and augmentin are usually mixed, but can be cholestatic and sometimes can be hepatocellular. So these ones are a little bit more difficult. And then there are some that only cause mixed reactions or cholestatic uh, reactions. And yesterday there was a patient where anabolic steroids were considered who had a hepatocellular element to this. And I mentioned that that would be extremely atypical. So uh, what we see here usually with anabolic steroids is bland cholestasis. So, so I've been part of um, what's called the Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network in the United States now for the last 20 years. I'm, I'm actually chairman of the Causality Committee, and uh, this has been a wonderful experience in which we have attempted to, um, here are the networks shown here, that's, yeah, you can see that, that's a picture of the United States. So most of the centers are in the eastern United States, a couple in the Midwest and UCLA out west. So the goal here is to um, aggregate bona fide cases of drug-induced liver injury. And with those, to understand the phenotypes of these drugs, and now we're starting to perform genetics on patients. And uh, there are a couple of papers that are now under review that are um, going to report some genetic associations with some of these classes of drugs. So our committee, um, which is critical in this effort because we adjudicate every single case. And what we do is we take the case, um, comes from one of the clinical sites, and then we assign each case to three independent reviewers. That includes the site PI, the patient who saw the patient in the clinic, and then two other independent, randomly selected uh, reviewers. We then um, create a clinical narrative where the details of the uh, clinical presentation and the laboratory data are um, aggregated and summarized. We assign a uh, expert opinion causality score as well as a RUCAM score for each one of these patients. And then we hold a conference call every month, the third Thursday of every month at 4 o'clock, to resolve a final score and place in the database. So when we started this, we realized that we needed to come up with some uh, methodology to assign causality scores. And this is what we came up with. We came up with uh, five domains of definite, highly likely, probable, possible, or unlikely. So this is how we um, score these drugs. And then 95 definite is, is a def it's, this is a definite case of DILI, um, in our opinion. And then um, possibles are kind of in the gray zone, and, and unlikelies are unlikely to be DILI. Um, highly likely is a good case, but not quite perfect. So we did a number of analyses. This is data from our first uh, 557 patients where uh, what I'm showing you here are the drug-induced liver injury scores 
uh, over here on the y-axis, so the expert opinion scores um, compared to the RUCAM score. So here are our domains, here are the RUCAM domains. And what you can see here is that um, there are some that are, you know, similar. However, there are many cases where RUCAM scores these um, lower than we score these. So we thought that there were a number of definite cases um, that RUCAM did not think were quite as likely. Um, RUCAM also has problems in the, um, in the cases. So there were a number of cases that RUCAM uh, scored as very highly probable, which we thought may have even been unlikely. Um, so RUCAM clearly, and we did a number of um, statistical analyses and um, expert opinion was significantly better in assessing causality than um, was RUCAM. So we had also better agreement in our initial scores uh, with the, the Dillon method uh, compared to RUCAM. There's a lot of scatter in RUCAM. Uh, compared to es expert opinion, as I showed you, RUCAM underestimates the drug and injury association in many of these cases. Uh, expert opinion exhibits less variability, and RUCAM tends to bunch causality scores in the middle, so it's not very good at differentiating uh, the causes of drug-induced liver injury. So in our patient, um, as I mentioned, this patient was thought to have uh, classic nitrofurantoin hepatotoxicity. It causes, it often has a long latency, as this patient, this patient was on drug for three years. It often causes a hepatocellular reaction, which was the case in this patient. Um, and so it looks pretty classic. There was one, so although expert opinion is very good, there was one slight problem with this, and that was the patient had a hep C antibody and not an RNA, and it turned out this patient had acute hepatitis C. So even though expert opinion is good, and I showed you the data, it is not perfect, and it is dependent on having uh, high-quality data. So what about um, um, uh, Dilly? Therapy, actually this is, yeah, DILI treatment. Let me come back to that. So what about treatment for DILI? Uh, so the, the challenge with DILI is that um, this is idiosyncratic. So we don't know who's going to develop drug-induced liver injury. And by the time we intervene, intervention is generally too late. Uh, so there currently is no specific therapy targeted at DILI. However, I think that what is going to happen in this field is that we're going to be able, with some degree of, um, I shouldn't say certainty, but suspicion that based on genetics and certain high-risk drugs, that we are going to be able to perhaps predict the development of DILI, and in those patients we might be able to um, provide prophylactic treatment. The candidates for treatment are includes uh, compounds such as cell membrane stabilizers, anti-inflammatory agents, and antioxidants. Um, you know, things like NAC, prednisone, whatnot have been proposed, but again, have never really been uh, shown to be effective in idiosyncratic DILI. Um, let me go back and tell you a little bit about, uh, the title here should be a uh, causality assessment. So in a paper that was just accepted literally uh, this last week, um, Hans Tillman and I have developed a uh, computerized causality tool. And so what we did was we recognized that certain drugs have certain signatures. So we took a number of drugs and then we uh, examined their characteristic latency, R value, and AST to ALT ratio. And we developed a, an algorithm that uh, mathematically assigned a likelihood that the drug was going to be causative using both positive drugs and negative drugs based on, um, again, a typical latency. So for example, Augmentin has a, about a 21-day latency. INH has about a 40 to 45-day latency. Uh, there are some drugs that have slightly longer latency. And so when you um, analyze the uh, characteristics of, of your patient against what is uh, published in the literature, you can develop a mathematical model. And so we're hopeful that this will be a new 
uh, element in drug-induced liver injury, and eventually we will put this online so that you'll be able to um, plug in as, as simple as three data points and tell whether your patient has, um, has drug-induced liver injury or not. Um, there is another resource that I hope you are using. Do you, does everybody here know about liver talks? Uh, if you don't, I would strongly encourage you to use this. This was developed by the network. Jay Hoofnagel has really been leading this, and this is an exhaustive summary of, um, of common drugs that have been suspected of causing DILI. It's very easy to use, and uh, there are often many cases that come from the network are, uh, are published in this. So a couple of take-home points. Uh, DILI is a, a clinical diagnosis uh, made by recognizing uh, s specific patterns of, uh, of um, liver test abnormalities and excluding other diseases. Expert opinion is better than RUCAM, and right now is the best causality assessment tool. However, you are going to see mathematical models come up in the very near future, and hopefully the, the study that we just published will be uh, the first step. So with that, I thank you for your attention. It's been uh, great to visit you here in Delhi, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the day, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.